العلم أشراف مطلب وطالبه لله أكرام من يمشي على قادم العلم نور مبين يستضيء به أهل السعادات والجهال في الظلم Doesn't recite the Fatiha. So these ahadith are specific in stating that the Fatiha should be recited. But with regards to the second opinion, طبعاً, the second opinion is the opposite to the first opinion, which is that the Fatiha should not be recited. Uh, the Fatiha should not be recited when the Imam is reciting the Quran. Or when the re- Imam is reading. And they use as evidence, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا Listen to the, if the Qur'an is recited, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ If the Qur'an is, is recited, then listen attentively and be Quiet. Also, or secondly, the use as an evidence the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In which the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was reciting the Fatiha or reciting the Qur'an and then the companion was reading behind him and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لَعَلَّكُمْ تَقْرَعُونَ خَلْفَ إِمَامِكُمْ it may be that one of you is reciting behind your imam and then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited them from reciting طيب إلا أن تقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب except that you read the Fatiha of the Quran meaning the Fatiha <laughs> نعم that's exactly what the scholars mention لكن they say that it has been abrogated the end part has been abrogated including the Fatiha Therefore the hukum now is that you should not recite anything khalf al-imam, behind the imam Even though that hadith, when it's complete Before saying it's abrogated, it's an evidence for the first opinion Like in they say the recitation of the fatiha has been abrogated Tayyib That's the two opinions That's mm-hmm. their evidence with regards to the first ayah or the first verse that they use with the Quran, Surah Al-Araf it's general so they say that in this verse because it's general Allah is telling us to be quiet and listen attentively when the Quran is recited طيب. these are the two opinions how can we say this is the Rajah or this is the Rajah Firstly, when we find evidence in a certain mas'ala The origin is that if we can combine both evidences, we should do so And that's what al-jam' bayna nusus is, is So for example, this mas'ala that we have now is possible for us to combine how? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with the Quran فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَانْصِتُوا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to when we hear the Quran to listen attentively and to be quiet that is general within the salah and outside of the salah that's general However, the hadith in which the Messenger said, La salata 
لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة في الكتاب there is no salah for the one that doesn't read the فاتحة that is specific so anytime we find a general text and a specific text and there seems to be contradiction between the two then we should give precedence to the evidence which is khas, specific as for claiming that is, it has been or it's mansukh, that it has been abrogated the asal is to keep all of the evidence as it is without saying it has been abrogated and when you're saying something has been abrogated there has to be from dhuhr asal maqrib and isha يعني the salahs that have four rak'ah and the salahs that have three rak'ah is from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to also recite another surah after the fatiha pay attention it's a sunnah to recite another surah so for example if a person just recites the fatiha and they carry on with their salah is their salah invalid or valid? valid, why is that? He's done the person's done the pillar. They've missed out a sunnah. They've missed out a sunnah. And if you leave out a sunnah in the salah, take it as a general principle. If you leave out a sunnah in the salah, your salah is correct. So from the sunnah is to recite another surah along with these two surahs, or these two uh, with, along with the fatiha. طيب تكون في الفجر so the sheikh is now moving on to the fajr من طوال المفصل طيب في الفجر طوال المفصل وفي المقرب من قصاره وفي الباقي من أوصاره the sheikh now is talking about the length of the recitation for each of these prayers so the sheikh says for salat al-fajr in general the Qur'an or the ulama of uh, al-Tafsir or the ulama that specialize in the field of Qur'an they divide the Qur'an into parts the first part is al sab al diwal the seven long surahs Baqarah Ali Imran An-Nisa Ma'ida An-Am A'raf Anfal and tawbah and Amfal and Tawbah they include it as one surah these are the long surahs then there are other surahs called Mi'iyun and when you translate it roughly they're the surahs that contain roughly about a hundred verses or hundred plus hundred ten, hundred twenty, so on then you've got a surah al-mufassal the surahs that are Divided, Mufassal, divided into Fusul, into chapters also. And the reason they're Mufassal, or they're called Mufassal, is because because they're short, after every surah you find the, fa- the Bismillah, the Basmallah, and then you find it again, and then you read about a page and a half, and then again you find the bis- Basmallah, and then you read a page or two pages and then you find the Bismillah again the Kathrat al-Fusul they say because there are so many stop start you end the surah and then you start the next surah end the surah you start the next surah whereas with Baqarah you find 49 pages consecutive likewise Al-Imran Al-Nisa so on طيب now this Mufassal where does it start? Most scholars say that it starts from Qaf up until Surah Al-Buruj Qaf until Surah Al-Buruj So the Mufassal is divided into three parts The longer Mufassal the medium Mufassal or intermediate and then the lower Mufassal so the first 
or the longer surahs that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to read in the fat in Surah Al-Fajr uh, in Salat Al-Fajr were from Fajr from Qaf to Surah Al-Buruj. So in Salat Al-Fajr he would read from anywhere in between Qaf and Buruj. طبعا changing around. And then there's the Awsab, the middle surahs. They start from Watariq up until Surah Al-Bayyina or Al-Duha or Samai wa Tariq up until Surah Al-Duha and Bayyina and then uh, the Qisar or the short Surahs from Ida Zulzilat to Qul Ud Rabi Nas so for the Fajr he would recite some, from somewhere along the lines of or in between Qaf and Durud wa fil Maqribi min Qisarihi and with the Maqrib, he would read from Ida Zulzilat up until Qul Adbir bin Nas. Yani in most cases, in most cases, it doesn't mean that the Messenger of Allah will stick to these surahs. Tayyib. Wa fil baqi min awsatihi. Wa fil baqi, yani the remaining three prayers, he would read from Wasama'i wa Tariq up until Wadduha or Al Bayyina. Lam yakun il ladhi kafaru from there. So that, was the, that is the recitation of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in these prayers. For more in-depth study into that, you can go back to or refer to Sifat al-Salat al-Nabi by Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullahi alayhi. Tayyib. From the Masail or the issues to do with reciting the Qur'an is takhfif al-Qira'a la'aridin. Shortening the salah or shortening the recitation due to a need. For example, if the Imam starts his salah and he intends to read Baqarah, like 10 pages of Baqarah or 5 pages, whatever it may be, and he hears a baby crying, Taban, his mother or the person who brought him to the masjid will be praying with the Imam. So it's from the Sunnah to shorten the salah. Because the mother of the child won't get khushur. Likewise, the musalleen, the people that are praying behind the imam, will not have a complete khushur. And there are certain hadith in which the Messenger wasallam said that he would start the salah intending to make it long, and then he would hear a child crying, and then he would shorten the salah. Tayyib. Also, from the other masail, is that when a person is reading the Qur'an he should make sure or that they should make sure that their ruku' and their sujood are of similar length of similar length to their recitation in the hadith of Hudayfa the messenger where he prayed with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and he read Baqarah and Imran and so on he mentioned that when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went down for Rukur, his Rukur was almost the same length as his standing in the, when he was reciting the Qur'an. And likewise his sujood was also similar to his um, recitation or the length of the recitation. So there should be kind of a balance. There shouldn't be any sort of inconsistency. From the clearest examples where there's inconsistency in the salah is when you find the Imam in Salat al Witr in Taraweeh in Ramadan reciting Qul Huwallahu Ahad in the last raka'ah which can last about a minute and then when you find them doing Dua al Qunut you see them taking half an hour and that is wrong because with the Qunut it should be roughly around the same length as the recitation before طيب the shaykh says يجهر في القراءة ليلا ويسر بها نهارا a general principle again of recitation is that the prayers that are prayed in the daytime are to be read quietly the prayers that we pray 
in the daytime are to be recited quietly as for the night prayers they can be or they should be recited loud a general principle when we're reciting the Quran or when we're praying is that during the day prayers the, and in the prayers that we pray in the daytime Zuhr and Asr or Tahiyyat al-Masjid or Salat al istikhara or any of the prayers that we pray in the daytime Salat al-Duha they should be recited quietly and to oneself as for the prayers that we pray in the night time then they should be recited out loud Maqarib for example Isha Fajr Taraweeh Tahajud Witr and so on Tayyip Another issue When reciting the Qur'an In the daytime And when praying Dhuhr Maqrib Afan Dhuhr Or Asar It's not enough that a person reads inside Of his head For example a person does this Without moving the lips That is incorrect Because that is not That's not reciting just because it's quiet, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't recite. That in a person should read out whilst moving their lips. And that's clear in the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, in which the companions would say that they would know that the Messenger was reciting because his beard or his chin would be moving up and down. And if it's moving, then you can tell that he وسلم, is reading. The Shaykh said that is the general principle. إلا الجمعة والعيد والكسوفة والاستسقاء فإنه يجهر بها أو يجهر بها كذلك. So the Shaykh says that is the general principle except for the Jum'ah. The Jum'ah is prayed what? In the night time or in the daytime? And the recitation is how what? Lao. كذلك صلاة العيد. Prayed in the daytime, however, the recitation is loud. والكسوف كذلك. If it's to be prayed in the daytime, then it will be the recitation will be out loud. كذلك الاستسقاء. الاستسقاء is the seeking rain. The prayer for seeking rain from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So verily, in these prayers, they are to be recited out loud. طيب. So we find from that that if a person is praying Maqrib and they don't read the Fatiha loud what should they do? but they've, يعني, they've they're just barely moving their lips like, and they haven't read out the Fatiha loud or the other surah out loud what should they do? is their Salah valid? and it's Salat uh, Maqrib and the person doesn't read out loud is their Salah valid? Why is it valid? Huh? Huh? So, it's not from the pillars. It's not from the pillars, so the person hasn't left out a pillar. His salah is still valid. It's a sunnah to recite or to read out loud. Tayyib. That's with regards to the recitation, reading the Fatiha, what surahs to read. In what prayers should we read what surahs and so on and how we should read then the shaykh rahmatullah alayhi says ثم يكبر للركوع the next thing that a person does is يكبر they say Allahu Akbar now this Allahu Akbar is called تكبيرة الانتقال it's the تكبير which shows that you're going from one movement or one position to another in the salah there are two types of takbirat takbirat al-ihram and 
تتبيرة الانتقال تتبيرة الإحرام is the very first تكبير in which you say الله أكبر and it's called تكبيرة الإحرام because it makes everything that was halal before that makes it halal uh, haram and it's the first or the second pillar of the prayer the first being the standing now if a person doesn't recite this takbir then their salah hasn't even started so for example if a person walks up to the row or stands up to prayer to pray and he says subhanallah and they read whatever they want to read and pray however many rak'ahs they want to pray their salah hasn't even started so we can't call it valid or invalid rather it hasn't even started because takbirat al-haram is what the salah starts with that's takbirat al-haram takbirat al-intiqal or takbirat al-intiqal means the takbirs that you would say when you're going from one position, one position to another so when you when you finish reading the Fatiha and another surah you would say Allahu Akbar and then you go down for a quote that is called takbirat al-intiqal going from one position to another and then when you're going down for sujood you would also say Allahu Akbar and then when you're getting up from sujood you would also say Allahu Akbar these are called takbirat al-intiqal now these are from the wajibat these are wajib so on your column on the rows that you've got where it says wajibat or obligatory act in the salah put underneath it takbiratul intiqal takbiratul intiqal tayyib likewise again you should say Allahu Akbar you can't say Allahu Aziz subhanallah Allahu Samad la Allahu Akbar tayyib ثم يكبر للركوع The next pillar that the Sheikh mentions is the ركوع The next pillar that the Sheikh mentions is the ركوع Now the ركوع is a pillar Frustrating in the Salah is a pillar from amongst the pillars And a pillar means that if a person doesn't do it Then that rak'ah is invalid So the rak'ah is invalid However if they've forgotten And they're about to go down For example they say After reciting the fatah in another surah They say Allahu Akbar And they are about to go down for sujood and before they go down for sujood they realize that they've forgotten the ruku'ah like they're almost halfway down in that case they should stand up and perform the ruku'ah again so if a person finishes his recitation and they forget to do the ruku'ah but they go down for sujood straight away if they are almost down or halfway down and they are able to stand up but they are able to stand up then they should get back up perform the ruku' and carry on from there and that rak'ah or that unit is valid why? because they rectified the problem which was what? the problem was what? forgetting the ruku' now they realized or they remembered that they hadn't prayed they haven't or they've forgotten to re- do the ruku' halfway down if they get up, they should perform the ruku' and carry on with their salah. However, if they remember whilst they are in ruku' or after whilst they are in sujood or getting up from sujood and they find themselves in the second rak'ah, then the first rak'ah is to be invalid. It's null and void. So this second rak'ah, according to the taqtid, is in reality the first rak'ah طيب all of these pillars all of the pillars that we are mentioning now 
they are to be mentioned in, found in the hadith Musi Salah the man who came into the masjid prayed and then came and gave salam to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him irja' to salli fa innaka lam tusalli go and return and pray for verily you have not prayed and he did so three times and then after on the third go he said verily I do not know any other salah other than this so teach me then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him these instructions طيب ويضع يديه على ركبتيه when a person does go down for ruku' they put their hands on their knees holding firmly onto the knee not onto the shin and not onto the thigh and they shouldn't hold onto the shin, uh, the shin nor should they hold onto the thigh they should hold on to the knee cap. وَيَجْعَلُ رَأْسَهُ حِيَالَ ظَهْرِهِ And he straightens his back so it's level with his head. So his le- head is level with his back. To the extent that if you put an eye object on top of it, If you put an object on top of it, it won't fall. It will remain balanced. Huh? That with going down for a court, I'm putting the hands on the going down for a court itself is a pillar. Like in the most complete way of performing the court, I sense the most complete way is that your back is straight with the head. Again, if a person does go down and there is a slight bend on his back then he has fulfilled the pillar of performing the Rukhwa so the bare necessity is there so for example if a person prays like this they've gone down, technically they've gone down for Rukhwa however if you put an object on top of their back it'll fall off Lakin from the sunnah is to make sure your back is level with your head to the extent that if you put something on top of it then it won't fall وَيَقُولُ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَظِيمُ وَيُكَرِّرُهُ وَيَقُولُ and he says سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَظِيمُ Glory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the exalted. And he reads this dua. Or this praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So saying subhana rabbi al azim is a wajib from the wajibat of the salah. It is a wajib from the wajibat of the salah. Naam. Is a wajib from the wajibat of the salah. And the necessity or the, 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 the way a person can fulfill the reading of this dua or fulfill the wajib is by reading it or reciting it once. So as long as a person recites it once then that is enough for him to have completed the wajib or performed the wajib. Sheikh says, what you karirahu? So he, the sunnah is to constantly to repeat it up to three, five, six, ten times. Why? Because you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. Like when a person is reading these ad'iyah or these du'as in the salah, they should understand and know what they're saying. And they should read it slowly. Subhana rabbi al-azim. Subhana rabbi al-azim. Like if a person says, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. The person reads it like that. They don't know what they're saying. And they won't get in khushur from what they are saying. So we shouldn't let our ibadah or our salah be a habit. We shouldn't allow our salah, our ibadah to become a habit. It should remain a ibadah. And the difference between the two is that when a person is performing ibadah, they know what they are saying, 
why they are saying it, them praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why they're saying all the words, how they should be said. Like when it becomes a habit, the person just says it for the sake of saying it, performs it for the sake of performing it, knowing that he's prayed. طيب. وَإِنْ قَالَ مَعَ ذَلِكَ حَالَ رُكُوعِهِ وَسُجُودِهِ So after saying Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, he can also say Subhanaka Allahumma Rabbana wa bihamdika Allahumma ghafir li fahasanu Then that is also good. I need to be praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord. All praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O Allah forgive me. To recite this dua that the Shaykh brings in the mutton is also mustahab. Uh, it's also sunnah to recite when a person is in the record. طيب ثم يرفع رأسه قائلا ثم يرفع رأسه after going down for record and being in a record and saying سبحان ربي العظيم طبعا the person has to get up the person has to get up and he says سمع الله لمن حمده طيب so getting up from a rukur is a pillar from the pillars of the prayer. Getting up from a rukur is a pillar from the pillars of the salah. What is the benefit of mentioning that it's a pillar to get up from salah? The benefit is that if a person is in a rukur and then they go down for sujood from there onwards then they've missed out a pillar in the salah in that rak'ah Some people when they're in a hurry after going down for rukur they briefly get up without fully getting up and then go back down again and that's dangerous because the person has actually left out a pillar the pillar being standing up from Rukur standing up from Rukur so that is the pillar and a person has to stand exactly how he was standing before going down for Rukur exactly how he was standing or she was standing when they were reciting the Fatiha and the other Surah طيب قائلا so he should also say سمع الله لمن حمده إن كان إماما أو منفردا if the person is an imam or munfarida, if a person is praying alone listen carefully or concentrate the shaykh rahmatullah says after getting up from the rukur you should recite or you should say سمي الله لمن حمده Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the one that praises him in kana imam if he is the imam يعني when should he say that O oh, shaykh Sa'di when should he say this dua سمع الله لمن حمده in kana imam if he is the imam or munfarida or if he is the one that if he is praying alone would you understand from that can anyone um, from the sisters clarify anything or highlight anything that we can understand from that that a person should say سمع الله لمن حمده if they are the imam or they are praying alone What is missing? Go back to the masala when we were going to the Fatiha. Mm. The one praying behind the Imam. According to the Shaykh Rahmatullah Alayhi, the one praying behind the Imam has a different dua to read as to the one that is the Imam or the one that is um, reading or the one that is praying alone. So with regards to the masala we learned in the beginning Tahrir Muhal Al-Niza' This one that is on the board Tahrir Muhal Al-Niza' Can anyone use this To clarify where the Tahrir Muhal Al-Niza' is in here Where is the khilaf in this masala For the person saying Sami Allah Liman Hamida Is there khilaf in, in general 
in every aspect for everyone or is it specific to a certain type of individual the one praying behind the imam has to say what Ahsanti. So that is Tahir Mahal al So, for example, when you're talking about Tahir Mahal al you would say there's Ijma' that the one plane alone has to say what? Sami'a Allah liman hamida. There's Ijma' and there's no difference of opinion amongst the scholars on the one, on the Imam. So he has to say Sami'a Allah liman hamida. Tayyib. لكن الخلاف في but the khilaf is in the person who is praying behind the imam so should he say ربنا ولك الحمد alone or should he say سمع الله لمن حمده ربنا ولك الحمد exactly like the imam or the person reciting or the person leading the prayer or the person that is praying alone طيب both of these or that is a difference of, there is a difference of opinion in the scholars some saying that a person only has to say Rabbana wa lakal hamd Why? Because there is a hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said If the Imam says Sami Allahu liman hamda faqulu Rabbana wa lakal hamd Tayyib And there is also another opinion that a person should also recite Sami Allahu liman hamda He should say Sami Allahu liman hamda Why? Because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli Pray as you have seen me Pray Also Innama ju'la al-imam Li'utamma bihi Verily the imam has been put there To be followed So that's quite clear In its evidence in The opinion that says that you should recite the person that's praying behind the Imam should say Sami Allah liman hamada and Rabbana wa lakal hamd at the same time because obviously the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Sallu kama raytumuni usalli pray as you have seen me pray likewise the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said innama ju'la al-imam or innama ju'la al-imam will yutamma bihi verily the Imam has been there or placed in order to say in order to be copied tayyib as for the hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu said If a person If the Imam says Sami Allahu liman hamida Then say Rabbana wa lakal hamd It isn't clear And it doesn't clearly state that a person Shouldn't be say Sami Allahu liman hamida All it mentions is that a person should say Or the person praying behind the Imam Should also say Rabbana wa lakal hamd It merely states that a person should also say Rabbana wa lakal hamd so in it, or in this hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if the Imam says, Sami Allah li man hamida, say, Rabbana wa lakal hamd, the Messenger isn't clarifying a rule in here. He's making it clear that you should say, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. But there isn't a prohibition saying that you can't say, Sami Allah li man hamida. And if there, if there was, then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have clarified. And the scholars usually, they say, with regards to these sort of issues if it was prohibited for the person praying behind the Imam to say Sami Allahu liman hamida then the messenger would have clarified the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have clarified and they use as a qaida la yajuzu ta'khiru al-bayani an waqt al-hajja la yajuzu it's not permissible ta'khiru al-bayani Delaying the bayan or delaying the clarification and waqt al hajjah. It is not permissible to delay the clarification. Yani, with regards to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ulama of usul al fiqh they say it's not permissible for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to delay the clarification of any one mas'ala when the necessity or when the need is there. So, for example, in this masala that we're talking about now, if it wasn't permissible for the person who is praying behind the Imam to say Sami Allahu liman hamida, then the scholars say that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have clarified it. And you find that in a lot of issues when it talks about an istidlal, how to make evidence and how to use evidence. 
فإذا قاعدة خير البيان عن وقت الحاجة لا يجوز في حق النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فعلى كل حال the stronger opinion الله أعلم is that if a person is time behind the imam they should also say سمع الله لمن حمده and when they stood up ربنا ولك الحمد حمد كثير طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحبه ربنا وعبا طيب so coming up from the record is what a pillar or a sunnah a pillar saying سمع الله لمن حمده سنه لا واجب واجب ربنا ولك الحمد واجب طيب ثم يسجد then he performs sujood he then performs sujood على اعطائه السبعه he performs sujood on his seven limbs كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم as the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said أمرت أن أسجد على سبعة أعظم I have been commanded to perform sujood on seven limbs على الجبهة وأشار بيده إلى أنفه on the face his forehead and the nose صلى الله عليه وسلم been commanded in this hadith the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم is saying that he has been commanded to perform sujood on seven limbs the first being ala jabhati or ala jabha on the forehead and he points towards the nose as well so that's considered one the face and the forehead wal kafain and the two hands wal rukbatain and the two knees wa atraf al qadamain and uh, the feet and the toes muttafaqun alayh طيب. So in this hadith the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that he has been commanded to perform sujood on these seven limbs على الكفين we understand from it that only the hand or only the palm should touch the floor there's a common mistake where people when they perform a sujood they put their whole hand arm from the elbow up into the hand they pull it on the floor that is impermissible and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from saying like the dog so verily that's how the dog sits also when it comes to the feet both feet should be on the floor sometimes what happens is people lift their feet up and not knowing unknowingly they lift their feet up whilst they are in Sujood طيب. There's a mas'ala That the scholars talk about With regards to the sujood How should a person go down When they're Performing sujood So now we're on Sujood The prostration Is a pillar Earlier on when I was talking about the Rukur I believe I kept on saying prostration It's bowing The Rukur Is bowing I believe and it's up for I kept on saying prostration Correct that Isana So the bowing is a pillar Like in the one we're on now is prostrating There's a Mas'ala The Shaykh Taban hasn't mentioned it Which is how should a person go down? When they're going down from Rukur How should they go down? Should they go down on their hands? Using their hands? Or should they go down using their knees? I'm sure it's a khilaf that Many of you have probably come across Does everyone know what I mean by when going down To go down on your knees? Or to go down on your hands What it means to be going down on your hands Again There's a khilaf Amongst the scholars As to what should be What a person should go down with You'll find that many of the scholars from Ahl Hadith They go down with their hands Imam Al-Bani In his book Sifat Salah 
it mentions that you should go down with your hands and we'll look at the adilla in a minute طيب. whereas if you find if you look into many of the fuqaha from the hanabila from different madahib they go down or they say that the sunnah is to go down on your knees first طيب, what sort of evidence do we have or what sort of evidence do we have for this hadith or why is there khilaf there are several hadith there is hadith Wa'il ibn Hujr radiallahu anhu in which he describes the prayer of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in which he says that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he would go down for recall, for sujood he would go down with his knees so wa ibn hujr wa ibn hujr radiyallahu anhu he is saying that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam when going down for recall, when going down for sujood he would do so with his knees so he's explaining an action from the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam طيب and that's the hadith that the scholars who say you should go down with your knees first use hadith of Wa'ib al-Hujr in which he said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam would go down on his knees sallallahu alayhi wasallam and so the scholars who say that a person should go down with their hands they use the hadith of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِذَا سَجَدْ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلَا يَبْغُكُ كَمَا يَبْغُكُ الْبَعِيرِ وَلْيَضَعْ يَدَيْهِ قَبْلَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ if one of you goes down for sujood let him not kneel down how the ba'ir or how the camel kneels down وَلْيَضَعْ let him put Yadayhi, his hands before Rukbatayhi, before his two knees. طيب. This hadith is a statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the hadith has two parts. In the first part the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that if one of you goes down for sujood let him not go down how the camel goes down let him not kneel down similar to how the camel kneels down so it's as if in order to understand the next part is as if a question has been posed to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya rasulullah so how should we go down if you prohibited us from going down how the camel goes down طيب, how should we go down and the next part of the hadith is an, explan- is an explanation of how you should go down. Let him put his hands before his knees. From the second part, what do we understand? Let him put his hands. And he's prohibited us from going down how the camel goes down. صح? The first part, the Messenger has prohibited us from going down in a form or in a manner which is similar to how the camel goes down in the second had- part of the hadith he tells us how to go down or the correct way of going down so we understand from it that the first part of the hadith is in opposition to the, first, to the second part so if the messenger commanded us to go down with our hands then what is he prohibiting us from? the complete opposite which is what? going down with your knees so it shows that the camel goes down with his knees first so the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is explaining it also nafi radiyallahu anhu explains that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam afwa nafi who is one of the students of ibn umar radiyallahu anhu explains that umar ibn umar radiyallahu anhu used to go down with his hands first and then he would go down with his knees and his hands would be precede his knees and he would say that كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يفعل هذا ويفعل ذلك. Then he would say that the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم would do that. So we have a fi'l 
of a Sahabi, an action from a companion, explaining and demonstrating how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to go down. Ibn Hajar radiallahu anhu wa rahmatullahi alayhi in explaining these hadith, he says the hadith of Ibn Hajar, this hadith that we're talking about now, is stronger in the Sanad than the hadith of Wa'il ibn Hajar. In terms of the Sanad, it is stronger. Also, what can be used as a type of strengthening is that in general, the statements of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam precede the actions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam if there is a contradiction. If there is a contradiction between the two. Do you remember when we were in Bab Qada al Hajjah, answering the call of nature, when a person goes to the bathroom? In an authentic hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam prohibited us from facing which way? The Qibla Not facing the Qibla And not putting our back towards the Qibla Sah? Tayyip And we have a hadith in which Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu Saw the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Facing the Qibla With his back to Sham And he's doing what he prohibited us from sallallahu alayhi wa sallam From one of the opinions in the Masala We did mention there are about 15 opinions in that from one of the opinions, which is a strong opinion, is that the statement of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is clear cut. However, the action of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there can be ihtimal, there can be a doubt, or there can be a specific reason why the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam did what he had done. However, with the statement. Can't say maybe the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam meant this. When the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is commanding us to do something or prohibiting us from something, we can't say that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam maybe meant this or maybe meant something else. Whereas with the action, sometimes there can be a specific reason why the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam did a certain action. طيب. Also there's the author of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu So Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is describing How the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go down There's also another narration Another author from Umar radiallahu anhu himself In which it's one of the tabi'een Explained that Umar radiallahu anhu used to go down with his knees However, he explained that he used to go down how the bi'ig or how the camel goes down. Uh. So, ala kulli hal, it is a masala that there is khilaf in. Lakin Allahu alam, the stronger opinion is that a person goes down with their knees first, afwan, the person goes down with their hands first. Due to the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he prohibited us from going down how the camel goes down, and then he clarified and said, "Do not go down with your or go down with your hands before your knees." By you. Lakin, however, way you do it is a sunnah, which means your salah is still valid. Ala ba'ihi sabha. We also mention that the person should go down on the seven limbs. ويقول and then he says سبحان ربي الأعلى says to the one that is most high to the most high Allah سبحانه وتعالى or exalted as Allah سبحانه وتعالى our Lord who is the most high and like with the سبحان ربي العظيم the minimum for saying سبحان ربي الأعلى is once the minimum for saying سبحان ربي الأعلى is once now when you're in sujood you can say Subhana Rabbi Al A'la more than once, twice, ten times. But you can also make dua. 
because there's a hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the closest that a servant is to Allah subhanahu wa taala is when he is in sujood. So when you're in sujood, it's a very good time to take advantage of, or sujood, when you, sujood is a very good opportunity to take advantage of and make dua. Now when you're making dua, you can make ad'i or dua which has been narrated, which have been narrated in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And you will find that the dua that has been narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah are jami' they are comprehensive. They are very jami', very comprehensive. And it's a shame that we find in, for example, in Ramadan when the Imams are reading Qunut, they make a lot of dua. And they just make up a lot of different ad'iyah. Which haven't been narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah. Although there is no problem with that. Lakin, if, if the Imam was to recite the ad'iyah or the du'as that have been narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah, it would be much shorter and more beneficial for him and for the Musalleen. So also, when a person is in sujood, they can make du'a for anything that they may want. Like, and it has to be in Arabic. It has to be in the Arabic language. It has to be in the Arabic language. It can't be in another language. <coughs> the Messenger وسلم, prohibited Muawiyah ibn Hakam, the companion, and when another companion said, Alhamdulillah, and he said, Ya Alhamdulillah, the Messenger وسلم, said, This salah is not for anything with min kalam in nas. It's not for re, yani saying or speaking or anything to do with the speech of the people. It can't be said in the salah. So, just like we can't talk in the salah, we also can't make dua in any other language other than um, Arabic Tayyib, someone can say Tayyib that means we can't make dua unless we know Arabic no, not necessarily just for a person to memorize a few dua in Arabic doesn't mean they only have to know Arabic Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la everyone's memorized it, it's a dua, everyone's memorized it Actually, many people who have memorized it don't know Arabic the Fatiha people have memorized it. Al-Baqarah people have memorized it. Like, and they don't know Arabic. So it's not difficult to memorize the du'as that you want for a certain occasion. To memorize it and then recite them in the Fatiha. Recite them in sujood. Recite them in sujood when a person is in salah. Like, and they can't use any other language. Thumma uh, yukabbir. So after saying Subhana Rabbiyal, after going down to sujood and performing sujood on seven limbs, then he says Subhana Rabbiyal A'la, Subhana Rabbiyal A'la, exalted is the Most High, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, our Lord Allah Jalla wa Ala, and that is from the wajibat. Saying Subhana Rabbiyal A'la is from the wajibat, and it is wajib for a minimum once. Minimum once. Thumma yukabbir. And then he says, Allahu Akbar. Meaning when he's down into sujood, he says, Allahu Akbar. And he gets up from sujood. He sits down. So that takbirat al-intiqal, again, is a wajib. What does takbirat al-intiqal mean? The takbirat, that you go from one position to the other. What is the other takbir in the salah? Takbirat al Takbirat al-haram. Tayyip. وَيَجْلِسُ عَلَىٰ رِجْلِهِ الْيُسْرَىٰ The Shaykh is now describing how you sit after coming down from, after sitting up from the sujood. And he says, وَيَجْلِسُ and he sits عَلَىٰ رِجْلِهِ الْيُسْرَىٰ Firstly, sitting is a, sun, is, a, is a pillar. You have to sit. Sitting is a pillar. So sitting between the two sajdatain is a pillar so a person sits on his left leg 
وَيَنْصِبُ الْيُمْنَى وَهُوَ الْإِفْتِرَاشِ And he puts the right one out like that. So the person works sitting on their left foot, left leg, including the left foot. The other right foot has to be directly or standing upright. And that is called this tirash. That position is called this tirash. The Sheikh says, "Why do they do this in all the meetings, the prayers, and the prayers? Except for the last one, for it is the one So that sitting that we mentioned now, that you would sit when you come out from sujood, that is how you sit for every single sitting in the salah, except for the last." Tashahud The last tashahud Meaning for example Salat al-Zuhur How many tashahuds in it? Two Zuhur Asar I mean How many tashahuds? Two So the last one Maghrib kathalik There's two tashahuds So the last one And Isha kathalik There's two So the last one Is you sit In a position which is called Tawaruk and tawaruk means that a person places their left thigh on the floor whilst putting their right foot up. Can someone demonstrate these two? Mustafa, come and demonstrate these two, please. Or Hamza, come and demonstrate these two, please. So when we're sitting for the sujood, for sujood, there's two ways of performing sujood. When you're in the first tashahud, or when you're performing between the sitting between the two sujoods for example you perform the first rak'ah you're just about to get up for and you're in sujood and you're about to get up but you're about to go down for the next sujood there's a little sitting there sah? that sitting that you would sit you sit according to how the brother is sitting now face this way like now so that's how you would sit for the first tashahud and that's called istirash. That's how you would sit for the first tashahud in the salah. Also, the last rak'ah of, of fajr, that's how you would sit as well. Because fajr has what? How many rak'ahs? Two. It has one tashahud. So for the tashahud al the first tashahud, and any sitting between the two prostrations and the salat al fajr, you sit, you sit in this manner. As for the last tashahud, the final tashahud, in Dhuhr, Asr, Maqrib and Isha, you sit differently, which is that you place your left thigh on the floor, and your right foot stays the same, stays up. Let's do the second one. MashaAllah. So that's how to perform the sitting in the last tashahud. The last tashahud means obviously for four prayers. The last tashahud can only be used or it can only be said for the prayers that have got two tashahud. Jazakallah khair. Tayyib. So sitting between the two prostrations is a pillar. But sitting in this form is a sunnah. Tayyib. ويقول رب اغفر لي وارحمني واهدني وارزقني وجبني So when a person goes down for sujood says سبحان ربي الأعلى and makes any other dua and then they get up they say this dua and they get up from the first sujood just before they go down for the second sujood they say oh Allah oh my Lord forgive me have mercy upon me guide me provide for me support me and elevate me رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَارْحَمْنِي وَاهْدِنِي وَارْزُقْنِي وَاجْبُرْنِي وَعَافِنِي These are the dua, or this dua should be recited when a person is sitting between the two tashahuds, uh, between the two sajdas. ثُمَّ يَسْجُدُ الثَّانِيَةَ كَالْأُولَى And then he performs the sujood, the second sujood, exactly how he performed the first sujood. How is that? 
يعني exactly how you perform the first sujood by going down by readings or by saying subhana rabbi al a'la a minimum once you perform the same way or you perform the second to shahud the second sujood in the same manner from now يعني up until now we've done the standing takbirat al-ihram reading the fatiha reading another surah going down for a court and then getting up for a court طيب once you get up from a court we also looked into or we also studied going down for sujood and we mentioned the du'as for the bowing and for the prostration when a person comes down from gets up from the first sujood first prostration they say this du'a that we just mentioned and then they go down for the second sujood and they perform the second sujood exactly the same method or the same way that they perform the first sujood the shaykh says and then he gets up مكبراً, while standing ala قدميه, while standing on his while using his feet to stand up so getting up from sujood is a pillar getting up from sujood to go into the second rak'ah or the third rak'ah or the fourth rak'ah is a pillar so getting up from the prostration or the sitting position is a pillar Mukabbiran while saying Allahu Akbar Taban again that is from the takbirat al intiqal that you the takbirat that you meant that you read when going from one position to another. And also when you're getting up, you get up on your hands, just like we mentioned earlier on. You get up with your hands. When you salli a rak'at thaniya kal ula and he prays the same rak'ah he prays the second rak'ah the third rak'ah and the fourth rak'ah if it does have four rak'ah in the same way that he prayed the first rak'ah meaning he should read the fatiha read another surah go down for the bowing read the dua subhanahu rabbi al-azim get up say sami allahu liman hamada rabbana wa lakal hamd to read Rabbana wa lakal hamd and then to go down for the sujood when a person does go down for sujood then to sit up say this dua Rabbi ghafirli wa rahamni wa hadini wa jibuni and then go down for the second sujood and say subhana rabbi al-a'la again minimum once and then get up that's a complete rak'ah that is the way that a person should pray his second rak'ah the third rak'ah and the fourth rak'ah why? Because in the hadith of the Musi, Salah the man that came and spoiled his prayer or did not pray properly, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, If al dhalika fi salatika kulliha. If al dhalika, pray like that fi salatika kulliha. In your salah, يعني the whole of your salah. يعني for every single rak'ah, then do the same way that you've just, I've just told you, told you. طيب. ثم يجلس لتشهد الأخير وصفته فأفتك بليتين الصلاة whether it's فجر which has two ركعات or whether it's مغرب that has three or whether it's ظهر عشاء that has or عصر that has four ركعات you sit for the first تشهد for example ظهر after performing two ركعات you would go down for the سجود and then you perform تشهد الأول ثم يجلس and then he sits لتشهد الأول the first تشهد you obviously have to sit for when does the first تشهد take place after performing two sujood after performing two rak'at then you sit down for تشهد يعني the middle تشهد the middle تشهد is called the first تشهد now the middle تشهد is wajib the middle تشهد is wajib the middle of tashahud is wajib
Meaning that if a person does forget it, then their salah is still valid. Like they should perform sujood al sahwi at the end. They should perform sujood al sahwi at the end of the salah. And there's a whole chapter for sujood al sahwi which we shall go into inshallah. So the way to perform it the way to perform it is when a person is in tashahud he reads this dua Atiyatu Lillahi wa salawat wa tayyibat Tayyib And this is the well known dua that we all read in the first tashahud Tayyib We'll stop on that point inshallah the first shahud and we'll carry on from here or from this point onwards next class inshallah we've got five minutes or four minutes if there are any questions then to follow